Good afternoon, and welcome to the last presentation on the last day of DOB's 2021 Digital Construction Safety Conference. I'm Ashraf Omran, Executive Director of Cranes and Derex Unit. So the uh, course description for today, and I will read the next two slides in its entirety, and then after that, I'm not going to read every, every line or line by line. Uh, this course will provide an overview of various types of cranes, how they are designed, set up, inspected, and utilized on the job site. Attendees will learn safety requirements for installing, using, operating, and removing cranes to avoid potential safety hazards. Attendees will review crane rules to develop the necessary strategies in order to mitigate risk and prevent accidents. So today's uh, learning objectives are participants will be familiarized with these different types of cranes and will be able to describe their distinctive functions. Participants will review examples of crane safety hazards to identify potential safety issues. Participants will review crane rules to develop the necessary strategies to, in order to mitigate risk and prevent accidents. Participants will examine the requirements for cranes and apply these provisions to design installations and inspections. So where are we now? So we have, so in the next few slides, I will give you uh, some briefing about where, what, where we are and what we have been doing in the past few years. Uh, so first I will start to DOB now build. Uh, we, we already launched a new system that allow all application to be filed electronically. So we, we launched that system, DOB now build for cranes this past year. We had two phases. We launched phase one for prototype and CD. And CD, for those of you that do not know, th these are for crane registration. So this, this is for device registration. So similar to car registration, there is a device registration for cranes. And the uh, July 7th, we launched the second phase, which was for on-site inspection. So when a crane, when a crane needs to be brought to a specific location, when an equipment user or the contractor hires a New York State professional engineer to, uh, to bring a crane to a specific location. And this past week, on May of this week, we already launched uh, the DOB Now Biz for the CN application by bringing all of the previous CN application that then filed in Biz into build. So all some metals are now allowed to be uploaded into build. However, the status of these applications continues in Biz. So you need to, uh, as if you are an industry member, and you need to see the status of this application and the application initially was uh, uh, filed in BIS, the status continues in BIS. Uh, the next update I will give you about uh, uh, 3319-01. Prior to 2016, we had reference standard for cranes. We had RS19-2. That reference standard has been repealed and replaced by 3319-01. And that first phase or phase one for the prototype became in effect on January 1st, 2016. And the second phase became in effect in 2017. And we had some cleanup uh, for the rule itself. And we also came up with uh, peer review requirements. And this was last year on July 23rd of 2020. Phase three and four both are about the inspection for the CD itself, annual inspection. This is to be determined, same thing for the crane operations, all of the do's and don'ts. So hopefully we will start this soon with the industry. Uh, we have already a crane committee, so we are, our hope is to start this soon. We also introduced CD8 forms in, the, in, in, 20, in 2019 that capture all of the required inspection, and I will cover this uh, around the end of this presentation, today's presentation. And we also came up with the lab director rule in 2017, became an effect. And we also came up with uh, three local laws, one for crane modernization that limits the crane age to 25 years in New York City, 
and this became in effect on January 1st, 2019. Same thing with the data loggers that capture all of the crane activities and also became in effect on uh, January 1st, 2019 as well. And then we have another local law for to measure the wind itself. When it comes to the building code, as some of you are aware that with the code cycle that every few years we do go, we, we do go back and revise the, the, uh, the building code. So we had a 2008 code, we had followed by the 2014 code, and now the next code cycle has been already introduced to city council. And you see here that the, uh, that the build number, the introduction, or the intro number 2261, as I mentioned, that was already submitted to city council. And from 3316 to 3320, they are all related to cranes. Okay. And then we are, and mainly I will sum, give you a quick briefing about what we did or what is important to you about this bill or that code revision. So the first bullet point here is we are expanding the regulations to account for knuckle bone, telehandlers and similar new technology that may come down the pipe. We've been seeing all those new devices that comes every once in a while. So we always have to take care of this. So knuckle boom, we're coming up with a new license for knuckle boom. Same thing for telehandler and mini cranes. So um, we are changing terminology around C2 and C3 license. Now we're gonna call it limited HMO license. So, and, and this is to create a specific license for the knuckle boom or the mini cranes. Okay, and also, like I said, this is going to give us the authority to create other limited license via rule down the road. If anything else comes in also to the picture, and then we can do the same thing and create a new rule. And also, one of the items <laughs> that we're working on, or we're going help to gonna help us down the road from the code perspective, is to give the department the authority to create rule to tie the CD, which is a crane registration, especially for bigger crane or bigger device type, such as tower crane, crawler cranes, or large mobile cranes, to the duration of the job. Uh, as some of you are aware, when it comes to bigger device type, it is always site specific. A tower crane expires, the CD expires the second the crane is dismantled from a specific location. So now we want to line up both the expiration date for both the CD and the CN for this. And this is one of the things that we're going to achieve down the road. And we also removing the terminology from code that implies a learner needs to be employed by the supervisor HMO. The current code can mislead or can you can you may think that the trainee has to be always under the supervision or has to be working uh, and employed by the HMO, so we are cleaning this in, in, uh, in our code. Back to DOB now built, and as I mentioned, we came up with a new system uh, this past year, and the next few slides will give you a quick idea about who can deal with us and who can, who have access to DOB now built. So we have some stakeholder, we have the manufacturer, now they have access, engineers, and engineers here can be the engineers for the manufacturer. Uh, all of the device owners and professional engineers. And we also have the inspectors, when if you have a special inspection agency, that they also have access to DOB now build as well. And then we have other stakeholder, we have the filing rep, we have the HMO, but now the HMO is required to go and log into the system and to tell us where they are working exactly. Okay. And you have to do the attestation as well. Same thing is applicable to master riggers or tower current riggers. The directors, equipment user, and any other licensees. So other licensees can be the uh, for many crane or pile driver when they can utilize the uh, training from the manufacturer. There are two portals. There is a public portal that has limited access for the public, but they can see the bigger picture, whether there is an approval for a specific location or not. 
And then there is the industry portal that allows our stakeholder to log in and they have more access to calculation, drawings, and who all of the, uh, everyone is dealing with that specific location. So in the next few slides, I will talk about uh, a type of devices. So we have tower cranes, mobile cranes, crawler, tile drivers, and derricks. Um, some of you also know that we also oversee the operation of also, and we approve mass climbers and two-point suspended scaffolds. Two-point two point suspended scaffolds, we only review the plans. So we approve the, the, uh, the application itself. All of the inspection is done by construction safety compliance. But mass climber is part of our cranes and derricks unit as well. So in this slide that shows uh, different or two, two different tower, tower crane, laughing jib on the left side and hammerhead on the right side. So laughing jib, the, the boom moves up and down and hammerhead moves horizontally like a hammer. And two quick uh, pictures for crawler crane on the left side and a hydraulic crane, mobile, uh, mobile crane on the right side. Both are mobile cranes. Another uh, crawler crane at Yankee Stadium. And the picture on the left here show, shows a derrick. And this was on 57 Street after when the boom collapsed on uh, during Sandy Storm. And the derrick was installed to take down the tower crane and reinstalled the replacement tower crane. And then the pile driver, mainly just to only drive piles. In the next few slides, I will talk about some safety hazards. So the uh, picture here on the left shows that gentleman here was uh, riding the, the crane block and on the right within a debris box and both so let me talk about the right picture first the right picture it happened that that crane after its installation was scheduled for load test and a load test is a must for a tower crane prior to the usage of a tower crane you cannot operate a tower crane without conducting a load test first so when the when DOB inspectors made it to the site for the load test and the crane was not even tested yet and was not allowed to go to operation, found the gentleman in the debris box and they were already removing debris on site. And so and a stop work order was issued and a few violations. The picture on the left, like I said, was riding the, uh, the block of the crane itself. And this is not allowed. And why it's not allowed? You always have to seek the approval from the department prior to even riding or being in a man basket in the city of New York. And this has to be shown on a CN application or when you hoist personnel. And if it's not shown, an amendment needs to be filed to show it on the plans itself. And they have to comply when the CN is sub submitted to us. We have to comply with both our rule, and this is a section of the rule, and of hoisting personnel, and also with OSHA requirements. This picture here shows a boom failure here, if you can, you can see it. Same thing here. This was on the FDR a couple of years ago. And here, the crane tipped over. Okay, and had, had a boom failure as well. The main contributing factor to all of these three pictures was the overloading. That picture here in the middle was Friday afternoon when they started to cut corners. The approval was for certain load to be picked, and there was another, another approval for a different crane to pick the Con Addison vault. What happened that day? They tried to finish everything with the same crane, not to bring the second crane to the same location and pick the, the kind of Addison vault. So they ended up, you know, that the bomb had failed. 
Same thing on the right, pick more than the lifting capacity for the crane for that configuration. So by the way, there is a failure here. Same thing on the picture for the picture on the left. And so the contributing factor was for all three was overloading. So when you look at the rule itself, this section clearly talks about the loads and that the loads has to be shown on the crane notice plan and it has to account for all loading condition, including wind. So it is very important to always not to exceed your, the limitation that's shown on the plans, whether it is the load uh, capacity, whether it is the radius or the boom angle. So all of the parameters that shown on the plan have to be followed. Here you see two cranes are in very close proximity of each other. And the rule is very clear. If you're going to have this in order to prevent an accident, that both cranes have to show on the plan the second crane. So the crane engineer has to show on their plan to the department other cranes. And if you see here in the rule itself, it does talk about site condition, what need to be shown in the drawings. And if you look at the last item here, that other cranes are there at the site. It's very important to do the coordination between both cranes, especially if, if there is any conflict or if there is any potential of a conflict between the two cranes, uh, whether how we coordinate, uh, do you have a, a radius, radio communication between the two operators and when to stop, very important. Picture here shows the boom in very close to the uh, supported scaffold. And again, when you look at the rule itself, it tells you about the minimum clearance. So that minimum clearance has to be kept. So it's very important to keep the, the uh, to follow the rule at the end and to follow the all of the instruction on the drawing. Usually there is a minimum of four feet uh, between the boom and any structure. And you, you need to keep in mind that the, the boom always can def would deflect. So that's why there is the clearance is very important. Here you see in proper setup, you see the crane was set up here. And here is a closer look and you see the cracks, the concrete cracks. Another one, no damage underneath of the crane itself, underneath the outrigger. And another picture, show the damage here and then they move it to another area. So uh, in order to avoid this, any crane setup in New York required the engineer of record to sign off on the crane after the installation of the crane. So when they do their inspection prior to the use of the crane, you know, this will avoid something like this by them not allowing, not signing off on this crane and not allowing the crane to go to operation. Here is a, a loose bolt. And uh, when it comes to uh, to the rule itself, there are periodic inspection and there are, and if you look here at that section here, that mainly talks about loose bolts or rivets. Uh, please keep in mind, especially if you have a tower crane, always look at your drawings to make sure when it comes to the ties into the building or when it comes to the foundation itself. Usually there are retorquing value and there is, Retorquing schedule, it has to be maintained on site. So always make sure if you are uh, having a crane on your site, make sure always to look at these drawings and to make sure you are in compliance with the requirements on these drawings. Here is, you see bent placing all over the boom itself, and the crane was in operation. And the rule is very clear that the operator is responsible. So this crane was supposed to be stopped and not to be allowed to, to continue its operation. Here the picture is from a distance, but if you, if you see here, you see Christmas tree. You see some loads on top of each other, two loads on top of each other. 
and that is prohibited. That's a no-no. The last thing you want is to unhook one load, and then you still you still have another suspended load, and then that load comes loose and and comes down on the the person that underneath of the load. And the rule is very clear that Christmas tree is not allowed. And this was part of the cleanup rule that came into effect uh, last year. Okay, so this was as of uh, July of last year, July 2020. Here you see um, this was a swing away jet. And I know that some of you may, would say a swing away jet does not require assembly and disassembly drawing or the assembly, assembly or disassembly director. Still, you know, like by removing the wrong pin and unfolding the and uh, unfolding the boom, it, or the, the swing away jet, that's what caused this. So you, being, you, you, always you need to look at the manual and to be very clear and not to remove the wrong pin and cause something like this to happen. They lost the entire swing away ship when it came down to the street. Luckily, no one was hurt. Uh, these pictures show some broken wire ropes or turn rope on the right side. And there are uh, several areas in our rule talk about uh, criteria, several criteria, how you inspect on what need to be looked at for uh, different type of, uh, of, of wires. And uh, if you see here in, in our rule, there is one area here talking about the broken wires. You see it all over the place. Same thing here in a different area of, this, uh, of the rule itself. Okay. Uh, that slide here shows a knuckle boom. A knuckle boom has been kind of a headache for, uh, for us. Uh, it has, the industry has been, years ago, they've been complaining about it, that there are no enough rule and code to cover the requirements for knuckle booms. And they were always talking about it, knuckle, they wanted to use knuckle boom for construction. We heard them loud and clear. We came up for, with requirements to allow the industry to prototype the knuckle boom, register these machines, and then file the CN for it. Today, to date, I have not seen any prototype filing for CD or CN. And we still see the knuckle boom in use throughout the city of New York illegally. And I know that the industry plays the, the game, catch me if you can, but we, we, do, we do take actions when we catch them. So if you see the picture here on the right, uh, it shows the knuckle boom that is used for construction. And the, here they are installing a column. And you see here another one, same thing. You see here they are installing the, the beam right there. And again, with a, with a knuckle boom. And here the left picture that shows a combination of illegal use and at the same time homemade ladder of clamps. Okay, so this was several issues at the same time. And like I said, when we catch them, we take several actions. A uh, few days ago, we did, in addition to stopping the construction site, we issued 17 violations. That's one seven to everyone on site. The owner of the knuckle boom, the operator, the equipment user, the GC, so everyone get few violations. So we are telling you, please, if you want to use a knuckle boom, make sure you have permits to use it or use it for, if you want to work and if you want to use the exemption, you want to work out, you don't want to use it for construction, you are allowed to use it for exemption. I'm going to cover this in the next few slides. And again, here, this is also not allowed. Okay, a telehandler, and you see here, you know, and instead of having the load on top of the fork, it is suspended from the fork. So knuckle booms, if you want to use it only, only for material delivery, the code allows, allows it, and the code has certain limitation. So if you look at 3319.3, it tells you if as long as the total boom length of the knuckle boom is not exceeding 135 feet, 
and the height is not exceeding 100 feet, and you are exclusively using the knuckle bone for material loading and unloading, meaning I'm bringing my truck, there is, there is load on the truck, I'm taking the, the load from one area to another area on the construction site. I'm not taking an I-beam, column, or beam, and then starting construction. And while it is on the hook, I am already bolting the connection together. That's construction. If you want to use it for construction, you need to have your, your CN, CD, and a license operator. Okay, as I mentioned here. And as I mentioned, we have I have not seen anything so far, no prototype, no CD, no CN for any knuckle bomb in New York City. And the uh, already the uh, the prototype rule became in effect in 2016, and the CN allows them to fight it with us when uh, into effect in 2017. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you cannot hold the load on the hook and connected. If you're going to do this affixation that or you bolted, that's no, no, you need to have CN, CD, and HMO. Okay. Um, a two picture here show a mini crane that this mini crane was working on the building next door and he lost the mini crane, came down through the roof, the roof of a garage. Luckily, no one was hurt. It only damaged this car right there. We came up with new rule for mini crane, and this became in effect in 2017. Let me tell you first what a crane, what a mini crane is. A mini crane, we define that it is a mobile crane, can be wheel or thread mounted. The boom length cannot exceed 50 feet, and the maximum lifting capacity cannot exceed three tons. So it has to be three tons or less. <clears throat> a mini crane, as we came up with the service notice to the industry, and this was in 2017, we made it clear that about all of the requirements when what needs to be filed with the department, okay? And it has to be filed, filed as an L2, and it has to be as an equipment, and you need a, a New York State professional engineer to file the application with the borough office. And we came up with what needs to be shown on the drawings or on the application when it is filed with DOB. So it has to show the make a model of the machine, the capacity, all of the site condition, the uh, maximum minimum swing radii, Boom clearance, taken and landing zones, when threshold and securing tie back. So if you look here at this requirement, this is similar to a crane application, but then instead of filing the application with the cranes unit, the application is filed with the borough office and it, uh, it is self-certification as long as you have the New York State professional engineer. And if you see the item here, secure and tie back. If we had a secure and tie back, on this crane, that crane would not fall to the building next door. Okay, uh, when it comes to operator qualifications, uh, a mini crane can be operated by either an HMO, so hoist machine operator licensed in New York City, or you can have a valid certificate that is given by the manufacturer and it has to be acceptable to the department. So far, we approve three manufacturer to uh, and their certification. And it has to be specific to make a model. Okay. Uh, can I uh, use steel erection and critical pick with a mini crane? Can I use a mini crane to do some steel erection? Yes, you can, but in this case, you cannot use your uh, uh, certified operator by the manufacturer, you must use a New, York, a New York City hoist machine operator. What if my uh, capacity exceeding one ton? 
And in this case, right away, all of the rigging crew and rigging supervisor, they must have the uh, rigging training. So they have to, to have the 16 and eight hours. Okay, so they must be certified. Do I need a lift director? No, you do not need a lift director when you use a mini crew. In the next few slides, I will talk, uh, uh, I will cover some of the items that are related to on site inspection. When an on site inspection filed, when you need to find an application for a specific location, there are many requirements in our rule itself. So the, both the code and the rule govern what the requirements are. So if you see here on the slide, so when an application is filed, you need assembly disassembly plan, and you need pre operational test procedure, calculation, certification, drawings. So you need load them, load them posed, you need win action plan, and it depends on the device type. The things are in red here that I will cover them today. And you need assembly and disassembly director, you need a lift director. There are many for the uh, many important items for lift director. You can, uh, if you go on our website and previous presentations will, I had covered that lift director uh, in the past. So if you are interested to know more about lift director from a prior presentation, please feel free to uh, look at our website and you will see the, the previous presentation. Fre frequent inspection and log requirements. And I mentioned about the, the local laws, but today also I'm going to cover uh, the last topic today will be the up updated CD8 forms. <clears throat> so when it comes to uh, the notice plan, so the way it works, you have an equipment user or the contractor. In our world, we call it an equipment user. When you file an application with cranes, this equipment, this Contractor is defined in our rule as an equipment user. So if an equipment user wants to use a specific crane at a specific location, this is when they go and hire a New York State professional engineer. So that New York State professional engineer, first thing they do is they go to the job site. They look, they do their survey. They look at all of the surrounding of the proposed area or proposed building where what needs to be done and what the crane is needed for. So they have based on this survey and the communication back and forth with the community user and they know exactly how many contractors are using the crane. So do I have a multiple crane user uh, or a community user? Do I have a steel contractor, they have a concrete contractor. Um, when they do all of this, they de decide based on this and based on each contractor, they decide the maximum capacity for the crane that needed for this project. And this is when they start from all of this and start putting together, first by selecting a crane uh, from Varieties of crane, you know, each crane lifting capacity. So when they start from there and they go and select the crane, when you use, you have a crane selected, now you go and you know exactly based on the site condition, you know how to design the crane dunnage or foundation when it is a tower crane. So it depends on the device type when you go and you take it from there. So one of the important items you, you, look, you look for is the ground and subsurface elements. Am I setting up that crane on city on street or a sidewalk? Or am I setting up that crane inside a construction site? Meaning right away, if I am setting up the crane on the city on city owned street or sidewalk, the Allowable bearing pressure is well known. It is 3,500 3, PSF. So, meaning when I'm designing my dunnage, I know that I cannot exceed that my 3,500 PSF. If I go inside the construction site, that value is unknown. 
So because it is unknown, now I need a geotechnical engineer to determine this value for me. So I need a geotechnical engineer to give me the report and tell me here is my bearing pressure value. So I know how to design my damage. Site condition, very important. You don't want to end up setting up the crane on, on a vault, okay? Or you don't want to impact uh, like a retaining wall or any other foundation. So the building next door for the loading post, so site condition is very important. Location and configuration, where am I putting my crane? Exactly, and that, that configuration of the crane, do I have any impact on the building next door or, or in the building itself? My foundations ties in. If I'm designing a tower crane, when I need to tie in the crane into my building, I need this. Uh, if I have some bolted connection for a tower crane or for a uh, tower crane connection ties or, or uh, foundation, I need to take this into consideration. Anchors, welded con connection, meaning I need to put all of the details on the job site, uh, on, the, uh, on the drawing for the job site itself. Uh, do I have a steel? Uh, the counterweight for the crane, the uh, aviation. So do I need to go to and get the approval for from F -F FAA? So to, and I have my lights. If, am I exceeding? Does the height of my crane about is above two hundred feet? This is when I need to go and get FAA approval and blessing. Uh, all of the electrical information, and we, it is more applicable when you work outside Manhattan. If you work on all of the other boroughs, when you have power lines, so that information is very important. Do I need to de-energize my line? Uh, do I need to insulate my line? So there is a co coordination also with the, uh, uh, the that line entity, and also special inspection have to be determined. And range of tolerance: Am I operating the crane in a limited area? Or am I moving the crane along the, uh, the construction site? All of this has to be shown on the drone. When it comes to the first item, the ground and subsurface element, they have to show everything. They have to show elevations and the section that shows all of the subsurface element. Loading post is very important. Do I need other engineers to be involved for my loading post? Is it the building engineer? Is it uh, the engineer that is supporting the, uh, the supportive excavation, the SOE? So it depends on every case is different. The site condition, you need to show the traffic direction, the, uh, uh, the elevations, okay? All of the, uh, do I have any above ground utilities or underground utilities, okay? Uh, the uh, location, very important to show it, the exact location of the outrigger and the maximum minimum swing radii. You cannot, uh, uh, swing radius, you cannot uh, all of a sudden pick from an area outside the swing radius. And we've seen that several times. And every time, unfortunately, we saw that ended up with an accident and with actually a big accident. And we saw that. Uh, and in every case, in all of these cases, you know, like we, we did take actions. So please make sure to be in compliance and to follow the approved drones. Putting them foundation, am I, uh, do I have a tower crane? I, I did mention the bearing value, the bearing pressure value, which is very important. Uh, the loading post, I will give some more details about loading post. My concrete strength, do I, what value do I need uh, of when I break some cylinders the, prior to the installation? Do I have a tower crane foundation that I need to reach certain value, uh, 8,000 PSI, 6,000, whatever the value is, prior to the continuation of placing the crane. Uh, sometimes you need to re reach certain value uh, before you put the mass section or the counter jib. So it depends on the approval itself. Please make sure to look at the drawings and to see all of the, the notes on the drawing itself.
uh, when it comes to bolted connection. Uh, the drawing has to show all of this, it has to show the bolt size, the grades, which bolt, uh, the specification of that bolt, to which value am I torquing that bolt? And like I mentioned, if you have a tie for a tower crane, do I need to retorque this bolt again? Same thing for my foundation. Do I need to retorque it and to which value and how frequent? All of this is showing on the drone. And like I said here, and the schedule itself. Uh, tensioning, pre-tensioning information. Okay, if, if you have uh, the your foundation, same thing, it's very important, especially for tower cranes. Uh, if you have the dowels, the, the grout specification. So all of this is shown on the drawing as well. And it's subjected always to our review and our approval. Same thing for the anchors. Uh, what type of anchor? The size of anchor? Uh, the grout specification? Am I using epoxy? Welded uh, connection? Do I? Uh, what kind of material am I using? Uh, the specification and the procedure. All of this shown has to show in the drawing as well. For structural steel, they have to show the members, the shape, the size. And all of this have to be specified. Counterweight. When you look at the application, it shows the weight. Which one? Uh, some uh, cranes are allowed to use some concrete counterweight, but the weight has to be tens tensiled on the uh, on the uh, on the drawing uh, on on the, on the on the counterweight itself. So you have to to uh, to see the weight clearly. How much it, it, does it weigh? on the on the counterweight itself and i mentioned about aviation hazards i did mention about some electrical information and when it comes to special inspection what happened is the engineer has to identify to us all of the special inspection items so they have to define it when they give us the form they also define it on the form and define it on the drawings it is subjected to our review. When it is approved, they have to, re to report back to the department on some forms, and I'm gonna mention these forms shortly. They have to upload these complete forms back to our system in order to use the crane. So the special inspection forms are very important. And I did mention about the range of talents, whether it, you are working in a specific area or do you, am I longing al along the uh, side of the construction site. Load imposed. Uh, there are a few scenarios for load imposed. So the first scenario for load imposed that when the load imposed are reviewed by the building engineer. So the building engineer can do report back to us in two different ways. First one is by writing a letter that include and states all of the drawing that they reviewed. So they list all of them and they certify to us that they reviewed these drawings for load and post and they find it to be acceptable to them. Or they can stamp the crane drawings and give it back to the crane, enge crane engineer and give it back to us. So these are the two scenarios that when the crane engineer reach out to the EOR for the building, or for whatever structure or SOE engineer and get the letter from. But what if the building engineer is not available? Building is very old and that building engineer is no longer in, in business or is no longer available. This is when the crane engineer can determine when the building itself was built to what the building code was built back then and do the assessment and they certify to us that that load imposed on the building is not gonna cause any harm to the building itself. And the building can support and sustain these loads from the, from the crane into the building. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> <coughs> So when action plan, 
So uh, in the next few, few slides, I will talk about when, when action plan. And I always talk about when action plan in every presentation. It's very important for you to understand the bigger picture about when action plan and what to do and what not to do. Okay. Uh, it's very important also to differentiate between in service and out of service. In service meaning I'm using my crane and this is during the operation of the crane in service. Out of service, I'm done with my crane. It's time for me, I finish my day or I finish my shift, okay? And there is nothing else after me. Now I need to secure the crane. There is no other contractor coming in to take over the crane. I need to secure my crane. So for out of service condition. So all of this are found on the drawing itself. So uh, the wind threshold, to what configuration, and the procedures, angles, all of this are shown in the drawing. Do I need to leave the, the crane up in the air, or do I need to retract the boom if I have a hydraulic crane? Uh, do I need to jackknife it or lay it down? Do I need to do some special protective measures for wind? Uh, so I must look at the drawing to determine this. And that's a joint effort between the HMO and the lift director. Both are responsible to look into this. We made in the rule, we made the engineer take out uh, or, and incorporate uh, the out of service configuration from the manual and put it on the drawing. So now the crane operator has access to this from two different places in the manual and also from the drone. So from the drone and from the manual. So there, there are always, you know, this is always covered. So they have to make sure that the crane is secure at the end as per this approved plans, which matches also the manual. Uh, what if there is a change in whether I have a long weekend or I have my weekend? And then all of a sudden the forecast shows me a change of the wind. So this also has to be, you know, planned ahead of time. And this back again to the lift director is the one that has to maintain lock in and always look at the forecasts. And if there is a change, they need to bring the crew back to the site to resecure the crane and follow the other recommendation on the plan, this has to be followed. And I will explain this in the next few slides. Um, keep in mind that for the in-service, the building code is very clear that there is a limitation of 30 miles per hour, unless that there is from the manufacturer, if the manufacturer is more stringent and which will govern in this case. If you have a configuration for the crane that limit the operation to a lower value, this is when you need to follow the manufacturer when it is less than 30 miles per hour. And this also shown on the drawing itself. Uh, so the wind action plan, it's always site specific. Okay, and it's always specific to configuration. So what is applicable to crane make a model is not a, applicable to another crane make a model. Even for the same crane make a model, what is applicable to Configuration one is not applicable to configuration two. So it's very important. Do not um, uh, expect or think that everything is applicable across the board. It always follow the approved drawings. Make sure to take a look. Okay. Uh, when action plan has to be implemented based upon site condition. So what if I'm supposed to lay down my crane, okay? And now I have a trailer on the way. I cannot lay down my crane anymore. So, and the approved drawings tells me that at certain wind speed, I need to lay down my crane. This is a time that the contractor, the operator and the lift director have to speak to the crane engineer and coordinate this because right away there is, uh, I need to amend the drawings, and it is very important. 
and I mentioned about the emergency action plan. So the table here shows, if you look here, that's for the end service during operation. And if you look here, this table is, is incorporated from the manufacturer manual. So you will see here a value more than 30 miles per hour. As a reminder, New York City only limited to the max that you can operate a crane, a crane is 30 miles per hour. You cannot exceed that. But you see here, for that specific configuration for that crane, you see a reduction of the load that can be lifted. Uh, you see here for that crane at 25 miles per hour, that there is a need to re reduce the loads by 20%. And at 30 miles per hour, the loads need to be reduced by 40%. So 20 and 40. As I mentioned, we are, do not allow anything above 30, but look at here, at 35 miles per hour, loads need to be reduced by 70%, okay? So always look at this table on the drawings and make sure to follow. For the out of service, very important to read the notes and to look at the drawing itself. You see here, it tells you up to 49, up to 49 miles per hour, you can park the crane. Okay, and it tells you what you need to do. Okay, upper in line with crawlers. But here it tells you with load blocks and with balls on ground. Read this carefully, and it tells you you, you need to put the load block and weight balls on ground. Look at the next slide. It tells you here what? Different configuration. Do not place weight balls and ground. So always pay attention to the notes on the drawing. Okay. Uh, so back to the to that slide. And it tells you uh, so up to certain wind speed, this is what you need to do. And then after that, you need to jack knife up to 80 miles per hour. So above 49 up to the 80 miles per hour, you can jackknife the crane, okay? Above 80, you need, you need to lay down the ball, okay? And as I mentioned that you need to, about the 30 miles per hour, the note is here, that you are not allowed to operate above 30 miles per hour in New York City. The front crane tells you clearly uh, for the out of service, you can leave the crane up, and it tells you about that boom angle and the laughing jib angle. So each angle is defined on the drawing itself. And I mentioned this, and then above 80 miles per hour, you need to lay down the crane. Okay. Sequence is very important. Okay. Um, and th that's another jackknife that shows you where about the boom angle and the configuration and everything is shown on the drawings. Uh, as I mentioned, sequence is very important. Uh, following the wrong sequence lead to accidents. And that's what happened in 2016 when the operator ended up in instead of lowering the jib first, lower the main boom first, put the crane in unstable condition and the crane collapsed. So very important to follow the proper sequence. So uh, what is written on the drawing and also shown in the manual. As I mentioned, the drawing is coming incorporated from the manual. So it has to be followed. So it tells you exactly everything. So this has to be looked at. And here the drawing here shows a crane in a lay down configuration. Uh, the last thing I need to talk about when it comes to an action plan, there are logs. And logs need to be kept on a daily basis by both the HMO and the lift director. As I mentioned, we have two people, pers two personnel or two persons are responsible to make sure that the crane is secured as per the approved plan at the end of the day or is in operation as per also the approved plans. 
and with, with any restriction if there are any. So both have to uh, maintain their daily log and it has to be kept on site. We always check for the daily log. Okay, it's very important. None of them can override the second one. If the left director tells the operator, you need to stop, this is it. The operator has to stop. Same thing, if the operator wants to stop, this is it. The left director cannot tell him to continue the operation. So we have two people are looking for, for this to make sure, you know, instead of one person, we have two responsible for this operation in New York City. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about the when for, for, for power cranes, site specific when analysis. Uh, so when uh, in, our, in our code itself, in, in the building code, there is in chapter 16, allows power cranes to be utilized or to be designed as a temporary structure. When you design a tower crane as a temporary structure, there is um, a must to be done also at the same time is something called an action plan. So if you're gonna reduce the loads from the 98 miles per hour to design your tower crane for a lesser value, this has to come in with an action plan. And you cannot reduce or use a reduction factor of more than 0.8. So this takes this design the crane for 78 miles per hour. So the action plan has to make the crane when it is implemented, allow the crane to sustain the 98 miles per hour. It has to be implemented immediately, okay? Within a short period of time. When you see on the forecast, you see a higher wind, okay? So uh, this also as a heads up in the, in, in the new building code, we also, uh, uh, the current code only talks and does not differentiate, only talks about cranes, but the word cranes here meant to be all, uh, meant to be only tower cranes, not any other device. This is gonna be uh, uh, revised in the new code cycle, and we'll, we'll, it will show clearly what needs to be done for different device types, and also mass climber, or two-point suspended scaffold. This has been expanded in the new code. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, tower cranes are site-specific, so a few years ago, I discussed with manufacturers, uh, all of the tower crane manufacturers, and I get them to agree that to be involved in the design of tower cranes in New York City. So there is a joint effort between tower crane engineer, manufacturer for the tower crane, and also the building engineer. So you have the Tower crane engineer or the crane engineer, after they do their survey, visit the site, they have to, to decide, here is my project, here is the crane model I picked, my maximum lifting capacity and the distance from the crane into the building, so the length of the time. So they take all of this and including the, the address is very important because it tells also the manufacturer which wind exposure, am I ex in exposure B or C or D? very important for the manufacturer. So when they give the engineer the forces back, they know exactly to what wind exposure. So, so the manufacturer gives back the engineer all of these required items. So the engineer takes these forces and including also the slowing moment and they design their crane. When they design their crane, comes in the building engineer, because now I have my forces into the building itself or into my foundation. Do I have a separate foundation or is this foundation part of the overall building foundation? So all of these load and poles goes back to the building engineer and the building engineer have to review it and approve it. Sometimes, you know, it depends on which scenario. Sometimes they add, add additional reinforcement to the slab Okay, uh, so it depends on the scenario itself. And then the, you know how to sustain, how the building can sustain these loads and the load path of these loads into the building itself. 
Uh, am I taking these building these laws to a shear wall or whatever is applicable? Okay. Uh, I mentioned it is a site specific and very important to see uh, on, on the drawing everything that back and forth between the engineer, the manufacturer, and the uh, building engineer. When the crane itself is designed, the, uh, the building, the crane engineer designed it, uh, even though that it is, the operation is limited to 30 miles per hour, there is a, a factor of safety here that they have to design it as per our code, as per our road to 45 miles per hour for the in-service load. And out of service, I mentioned it has to be up to 98 miles per hour. Uh, every crane is different. Every action plan is different from one tower crane to another. If the crane is designed for a lesser value than the 98 miles per hour, then you have an action plan. Sometimes you have to release some ties. Sometimes when you have multiple tower cranes on site, sometimes you remove a, uh, the, the boom itself because the two cranes are very close to each other. Uh, sometimes you lower the climbing frame. So every crane is different. You need to look at this and the manufacturer already is blessing this, okay? Uh, the last topic I'm gonna talk about, and I know that I've been a few minutes uh, uh, over my, my time, I'm, I'm almost done. So the last topic I'm gonna talk about is CD8. We came up, as I mentioned, with new CD8 forms uh, a couple of years ago. So we have a new CD8 form. When you have, we have a new CD8 TR form and CD8 AD form. Uh, prior to this, we were always using the TR forms from that is applicable in the borough office. And we didn't like to continue like this because it was not really applicable to our crane. So this is when we limited and we came up with our new form that only totally applicable to, to crane operation, does not have other item that has nothing to do with cranes. So, uh, uh, but it, it does require special inspection agency, okay? Uh, CD8 form is done by the engineer. It is always filed, 100%. But you, you, will, you, you are always required to have your own CD8 form. CD8 TR form only required when there is a special inspection. If the engineer uh, de de defined or uh, determined on the drawings and uh, on the application to us and submit to the CD8 TR form that there are some items that require special inspection, this is when it is applicable. And the CD8 AD is for the uh, assembly and disassembly director. It is required and accepted only by a master rigger or tower crane rigger when it is a tower crane. It is only applicable or only uh, uh, that it is a must to have a master rigger when there is a critical pick. And other than that, assembly and disassembly director can can be the one that's signing off on that form. Most of the time you're gonna see this form is required, except very few cases when the crane itself is installing its own counterweight or when it's a swing away ship that you do not need to do anything. You're not assembling any, uh, any uh, component on the crane with the user of another crane. Uh, as I mentioned, CD8 form, we came up, added a few items that we uh, incorporated from our rule itself. We referenced the rule section. CD8 TR, it is, I mentioned that it replaces TR form, the TR1 form, and it, it requires multiple filing for each applicable phase. Every time you have, you have a tower crane, you're jumping that tower crane, you need to, to to fill out a new form and it needs to be uploaded to, into our system. Okay, and I did mention about you need to identify your inspection agency and you are identifying all of the requirements, which item that is, a, is subjected to special inspection. Okay, uh, that slide here shows a tower crane foundation. And you see here on the CDA TR form, there are some special, special inspection item for the deep foundation, for the reinforcement, for the concrete. Okay, um, CD8 form, as I mentioned, it is 
required from the crane engineer. Keep in mind, the crane engineer is our gatekeeper, is the one that has to review all forms prior to signing off on that form. So the crane engineer is the one that has to collect all forms. Do you know exactly what is needed for that form? Uh, they review the special inspection agency report. They review the CD8 AD form, and then they can sign off on their form and upload all forms into our system. Okay, this is when the system DOB now build allow the status of the application to be cha changed from approved for installation to approved for use. Before that, the crane cannot be used. So pay attention to the status of the uh, the crane in the system itself and you'll be now built. Uh, part of the form also for the CD8 uh, AD is the uh, unassembled inspection, assembled inspection. I mentioned the load test and then the rigger has to sign off or the AD director. So this is the last slide. So quick thing, who inspect this connection? So you see this connection here? Anything is right here on the mast. So anything except the foundation. Remember here, that foundation here, this is subjected to special inspection agency. So to sub subjected to special, in, uh, it has to be done by a special inspector, okay? Uh, anything other than that on the mast from the foundation all the way up, including colors, and the tie here into the collar, into the mast, all of this has to be done by the master rigger or tower current rigger. So this is a tower current rigger, this is a tower current rigger. Whether it is uh, a pin connection or a, a bolted connection, so they have to do this. Do I need to torque my, uh, my bolt to, to which value? So this has to be done by the master rigger or tower current rigger. That connection here into the building, that this has to be done by spe special inspection agency, similar to uh, the foundation of the tower crane. That tie here, there are two scenarios. You can have a tie coming in from the manufacturer, which is good, or you can have a tie from a steel fabricator. And which, when it's coming from a steel fabricator, it is already approved. All they have to do is, in this case, the engineer has to look at the tie on, on the construction site to make sure that there are no damage to this tie before the installation of that tie. And with that, that this will conclude my presentation for today.